Okay, so our, our Milky Way galaxy, not everyone on uh, knew about them. No one knew about the Milky Way until about 100 years ago. I mean, we knew the Milky Way was there. We could see this band of light stretching across the sky. We could see these dark regions in it, but we didn't know it was a galaxy. That was only proven about a century ago by Edwin Hubble, and the Hubble Space Telescope is named after him. So to get a photo like this, you need to open up your camera lens and allow it to gather light for a long time, a time-lapse photo. And so we're actually getting dimmer light than you would probably see naked eye. And we're seeing a lot more detail in the galaxy as a result, including these dark regions, which are zones of dust and gas, and they block out the light from the stars behind them. And you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I see that there are stars in this dark region. Well, those stars are between us and the gas. These stars are closer than that gas cloud way back there. And these stars off to the side are also part of our Milky Way galaxy. The thing is that it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on because we're inside of the thing. We are inside the Milky Way, and it is way too big for us to get outside of it and look back at our home. Um, so I compare it to, let's say, um, when you were a little kid and you fell asleep in the car and your parents carried you into a friend or a family member's house and you'd never been there before. They carried you in when you were asleep and you wake up in the morning in this strange room and you can see what's around you, but you have no idea what the rest of the building is like. You have no idea what it looks like from the outside. And so that's what it's like for us inside the Milky Way. It turns out that by using light of different kinds, uh, X-rays and radio waves, as well as visible light, and then by looking at more distant galaxies, which we didn't always know were separate galaxies, but we were able to prove that. That's what Hubble did, really. Um, by looking at these more distant galaxies, we, could, we, we can compare them to what we think the Milky Way is like. And so now we think the Milky Way is basically a big disk of stars in a spiral pattern. And there are more of them in the middle, so it kind of bulges in the middle. It's basically like we live inside of the edge of a Frisbee or of a, of, of a record or a, a DVD-ROM or something like that, we, a Blu-ray disc. We live inside of the edge of this disc about halfway out. So here's a guy looking at the Milky Way. And, uh, you know, ancient people probably, again, couldn't see quite this much detail, but because they didn't have city lights... They certainly saw more than we do now. Um, and one explanation that the ancients had for it was that it was milk spilled across the sky. Um, it's just that it's so many stars packed together and they're so far away that these tiny points of light all merge together. Now, this photo would have been on, taken on a completely dark night but because they left the camera lens open, we can see the ground. Enough light bounced off the ground from just the stars that the camera could pick it up. This guy probably did not stand in one place for a long time. He probably just went there for long enough to be visualized and then walked out of it. But now we know that the, the Milky Way itself is a galaxy and it's made of billions of separate stars. Um, and it's all around us, above and below. So you see different parts of it from the southern hemisphere than you do from the northern hemisphere. And we also have discovered that this is just one of many other galaxies. So each galaxy can have billions of stars in it, and there are billions of galaxies in the universe, and each of those billions of stars can have planets. And so if that, of course, leads to the question, do any of those planets have life? And that leads to the question, do any of those planets have intelligent life? And that leads to the question, do, does any of that intelligent life, would it have the technology to communicate with us or to travel and visit us? And 
by our understanding of the laws of the universe at this time and our current technology, the answer to that has to be no, because the distances are too great to cross. The Milky Way itself, if we look at this, it's a big disk. It's flat in this direction, right? The thickness right here is a thousand light years. That means light released by this star takes a thousand years just to cross that way. A thousand years just for light to cross, and we know of nothing that can travel faster than light. So that means communicating with these people would basically be impossible, even if they are out there. Unless there's some laws of physics that we haven't discovered yet that allow things to travel faster than light. That's the only possibility of being able to interact with other, um, other species from other planets. So in, in this photo, you can see these dark regions. Those are called the Great Rift, or we can refer to them as dust lanes within the galaxy. And these are very dense clouds of interstellar gas and dust between the stars, and that blocks light from reaching us from more distant regions of the galaxy. So this whole kind of bulge in the center of light here should be all glowing, but because this dust is in the way, we can't see all of that glow. Now with other forms of light, we could see that, like radio waves can pass through that dust. Okay, so here's another diagram. Um, looking down on the Milky Way from the top, and here's some statistics about it. So, it's about 150,000 light years across in diameter. Um, now, it might be bigger than that. I've seen measurements ranging from 100,000 to 300,000 light years across. Um, and the way it could be bigger in particular is due to dark matter. Dark matter is any matter that does not give off light, so we would not be able to see it from Earth if it's not giving off light like that gas and dust would be dark matter. Or perhaps there are um, old stellar fragments of, of worn out aged star that's not giving off any light or heat anymore. It's, it's faded away into a black dwarf. That would be a form of dark matter. There could just be loose um, atomic particles that are not giving off light. That could also be dark matter increasing the size of the galaxy beyond what we can see. So 150,000 light years across, 100,000, excuse me, 1,000 light years thick. And we're, as you can see, about halfway out to the edge, from the center to the edge. And we orbit around every 230 million years or so, we make another orbit around the entire galaxy, our entire solar system orbiting with us. The mass of the galaxy is about the size of 900 billion, why don't we just call it a trillion suns. And there's at least 100 billion stars in the galaxy. And the type of galaxy, which we're going to talk more about next class, is a barred spiral. So we have a spiral shape with a bar in the center of it that the spiral arms are coming off of this bar. I'll show you a picture of that later. The sun's about halfway between the center and the edge of the galaxy. And so as we've learned more and more about our surroundings, we've end up, ended up pushing humanity less and less to the center of things. Um, you, it's all about me, right? Well, not so much anymore, according to what we've learned. We used to think that the Earth was the center of the entire cosmos with the sun going around it. And then uh, an astronomer named Copernicus made observations showing that, well, it could work just as well that we were going around the sun and it would look the same way as it does what we seem to see is the sun moving across the sky, but Copernicus came up with a suggestion that we were going around the sun. 
Galileo then took a primitive telescope and basically proved that that was happening. However, this took humanity out of the center of things, and it did not make the church happy. And so they arrested him, and they told him that he either had to recant his findings, in, the, in other words, deny the data that he had collected, or they were going to execute him. Well, he chose to recant, um, but that still, the, the church locked him up in house arrest for the rest of his life, like 20 years in house arrest. Um, and we've been here two months and we're going crazy, right? So we keep getting pushed further and further out from the center of things. First, it was that the the earth is no longer the center with the sun going around it. And now it's the sun isn't even the center of the galaxy. And not only that, the Milky Way is not our only galaxy out there. So it takes us basically a quarter of a billion years to circle the galaxy once, our whole solar system, which means the solar system's about, I guess you could say, 18 years old. <laughs> in that sense, because a year would be one orbit around the sun for us. A year for the sun, could we consider that one orbit around the galaxy? I don't know, maybe. But uh, it's gone around 18, maybe 20 times around the center of the galaxy in its four and a half billion year life. Meanwhile, the galaxy is about 12 and a half billion years old. So the sun was formed much later than the entire galaxy, and new stars are still forming today. Okay, so here's another way of looking at it. Uh, this is an artist's representation of what the Milky Way galaxy might look like. And to put it in perspective, imagine that the solar system from the sun out to the orbit of Neptune was the size of a quarter. If that's the case, then the galaxy is the size of the contiguous U.S. So our solar system is only as big as a quarter, but the galaxy goes from California to Maine and from Florida to Washington. So we're a pretty tiny little spot in there, right? Not the center of it, just a little thing. Okay, so um, let's see. On this slide, there's a few diagrams. I kind of like the ones on the bottom. Um, and you could perhaps sketch this diagram of the top view looking down on the galaxy, as well as the one on the side view, and then label its parts and maybe m note some of the characteristics of each of the parts as we go. So the structure of the Milky Way and its different regions of the galaxy. Basically, the galaxy is a flat disk with a bulge in the center, right? You can see this flat disk and the bulge in the center, so you can label those in your diagram. And then if we look on top of it, we can see that the disk is made of these spiral arms coming from the center out to the edge as the, the galaxy is orbiting around. It's forming these spirals. And this is where the new stars are forming, are in these spiral arms. It's also where the sun is in one of the spiral arms. We're in one of the minor arms. We've actually mapped these and named them. I believe the one we are in is called the Orion arm. And the galaxy itself is surrounded by what we call a halo of other stars, which are in smaller groups. And these are called globular cl clusters. A globular cluster of stars is like a sphere of stars, a ball of stars, um, and they're very old and they're packed pretty tightly together. And there might be 100,000 of them in one globular cluster. We're going to look at them in more detail in a minute. And these are more three-dimensional. They're surrounding the entire bulge in 3D, making this halo 
of globular clusters surrounding the disk of the solar system. And we have evidence that the center of the galaxy contains a supermassive black hole. And that's what is holding everything else in orbit around it. Supermassive black hole, not a regular black hole from a single star, but a supermassive black hole. What we think is going on is it might be the size of a billion suns. Except I shouldn't have said size, I should have said mass. It is as heavy as a billion suns, but its size would actually be infinitesimal, smaller than a dot you could draw with your pencil with the mass of a billion suns, which is clearly beyond the ability of our minds to, to understand it. We just can't wrap our head around matter that is so different than what we experience in our daily life. But that's what a supermassive black hole would be like. We can calculate it, but to really understand it, I don't know. So these are the basic parts of the galaxy. We've got the bulge, the disk, the spiral arms, the halo, and the globular clusters, and inside a supermassive black hole. Here's another diagram showing this. Um, the star forming regions are primarily in the arms, not so much in the halo anymore, as we'll see. We're getting new stars in the spiral arms. Here's the sun, approximately. Galactic bulge. Again, this is a barred spiral. Do you see how the arms are not coming from the very center? They're coming from the edges of this bar. That's what we mean by a barred spiral. Black hole in the middle. Uh, we have all these clouds of a variety of molecules. Gas and dust is how we could think of them. And that's where we're getting new stars forming. These are also found in the spiral arms. So this is another artistic representation. Okay, let's look at a globular cluster a little more closely. So here's a photo of a globular cluster, and you can see that there are a ton of stars packed together in there. And so these are like a ball of many stars, and it turns out they're quite old stars, and they also orbit the center of the galaxy. But they don't necessarily orbit um, in the disk. They can orbit from above and from below. Just like the Oort cloud surrounds the disk of the planets orbiting the solar system, the Oort cloud is more three-dimensional, and the planets orbit in a flat disk, two-dimensional. The same thing is true with most of the galaxy is in this flat disk, but these globular clusters are three-dimensional around it. So they're found in the halo above and below the disk of the galaxy. They can contain as, as many as 100,000 or even more stars than that. And these are old stars. Some of the oldest stars in the galaxy are there. So we're going to see stars towards the end of their life cycle, white dwarfs and so on. So you can actually see globular clusters yourself with binoculars. Um, it's best to look for them in the summertime. And you look to the south where you can find Sagittarius. So you find the teapot of Sagittarius, you find the Milky Way next to it. That's where the center of the Milky Way is, right off the point, the, the um, I guess, the spout of the teapot, center of the Milky Way. And then if you take your, your binoculars and you scan along the sides of the Milky Way, on either side, above it and below it, you can find these globular clusters, which look like this through your binoculars. Um, lots of many points of light all packed together in a spherical shape, a ball of stars all together. Then they have these numbers here, NGC, whatever, um, depending on when they were classified and so on. But the, basically you look towards Sagittarius because that's the center of the galaxy. So we're looking through a lot of our galaxy in that direction. And then 
you look on the edges of it into the halo of the galaxy to find these globular clusters. I always thought they kind of looked like uh, clusters of frog eggs. If you've ever seen frog eggs in a pond where there's a bunch of these little spheres all together in a ball, that's what they remind me of. Okay, so a little technology break here, and yeah, I should have some EDM going, I think. Um, so how did we find out about this stuff? How did we how did we learn that we're inside this big galaxy? What did it take for us to prove that the Milky Way is a galaxy separate from the others? Well, to do this required new technology that allowed us to measure the distance to stars that are very far away. So if you did the um, if you did the star measurement activity last week, you learned about parallax. Or we can talk about uh, the parallax angle. And so what happens is when we look at things from a different angle, we could actually use trigonometry to calculate how far away they are. And the classic thing to do is to hold up your thumb um, about a foot in front of your face and look at it with one eye but then notice what's lined up behind it. And then when you switch eyes, you'll see that the thumb is lined up with different things behind it. As you switch the angle of your view from your left eye to your right eye, the location of the thumb appears to change. And you could actually calculate its distance using trigonometry, knowing the distance between your eyes, knowing the angle that it changed, would allow you to calculate the distance from your eyes to your thumb. And we can do the same thing as that as we orbit the sun. Our angle of viewing the stars changes between June and December. So six months apart, we're looking at the same stars at a different angle. And if the background stars are changing, we can calculate that angle and knowing the distance between our position in June and December, which is about 200 million miles, we can then calculate how far away those stars are using this parallax angle. But that only works for closer stars. If you get too far away, then the angle doesn't seem to change. So some of these parallax stars, close ones, were discovered to be variable stars, where their brightness increases and decreases in a, in a rhythm. They seem to be pulsing in the night sky, like these examples above. So first, we discovered some stars that pulse rather rapidly, and we named them RR Lyrae variable stars. And these guys um, are, were first described in the constellation Lyra. Similarly, the Cephid variables were first described in the constellation Cephas, and they tend to pulse more slowly. So this rhythm of their pulsating light ranges from a few hours to a few months long, and we could calculate that if they were pulsing more slowly, they were actually a brighter star. So a slower rhythm would give a brighter star, and that's its absolute magnitude, its true brightness. So this is different than apparent magnitude. The apparent magnitude is how bright a star seems from our viewpoint, but that's going to be influenced by how far away we are from the star. So if a star is closer, it's going to look brighter, and if it's farther away, it's going to look dimmer. Well, because we could use parallax with these close stars to find their actual distance, we knew their apparent magnitude, but if we know their distance and their apparent magnitude, we can find their true absolute magnitude. And we found that there was always a consistent relationship between the speed of their rhythm and their true brightness. The slower, the brighter. Now, if we know that pattern, we can look at more distant stars. We can measure their rhythms easily, and we can use that to calculate their actual brightness, their absolute magnitude. Once we know that absolute magnitude, we compare that to their 
apparent magnitude, how bright they seem, and that allows us to calculate their distance. And that's how we found that the globular clusters were not within the disk of the Milky Way. In fact, when we start mapping those globular clusters, we end up finding that they make a sphere with the center at the core of the galaxy. The center of the sphere would be the core of the galaxy. And we are within that sphere. Once we do the calculations, we have found that we are inside this sphere, the galactic halo, and that placed us within this galaxy and not at the center of it, halfway out to the edge. Then we were able to use this same kind of process to look at more distant galaxies and prove that they were not within our own galaxy. And this is the work that was done by Hubble around 1920, 100 years ago, to prove that we are in a galaxy which is separate from the other billions of galaxies out there. Okay, now we're going to compare two different kinds of stars, two different stellar populations that we find in the Milky Way. And basically we find one population in the globular clusters and we find another population in the arms. So most of the stars you see at night are within these spiral arms. They're in the disk of the Milky Way. Almost every star you see is part of the disk of the Milky Way and we're inside of it. Um, so we see some above us and some below us and some to the north and some to the south and to the east and the west. In all directions, we're surrounded by it because we're within it. And we've known about these all the time, you know, since since there were before there were people. As long as you can see the stars, you can see these guys. So when I say discovered, the first discovered, it's not really that they were discovered. It's just that we've always known about them. We've always seen them. Um, and so... Since we've always known about them, we call them population one stars. But then with the discovery of globular clusters, we found that they had different characteristics. Their stars had different characteristics. There is a, a distinct pattern in the characteristics of stars within globular clusters that was different than the main stars we find around us, the population one stars. And since these globular clusters, these stars were described later, because you really need binoculars even to see them, um, we call these population two stars. Now we've even found a, a group of stars called population three. So the numbering of these, population one, two, three, is about when people became aware of them. It is not about their age, because in fact their age is completely backwards. The population one stars are the youngest. Globular clusters, the population two stars, are older. So these population two stars were found both in the globular clusters and in the bulge. But the spiral arms, primarily population one stars. Okay, so how do we differentiate the population one from the population two? Well, it has to do with the elements found inside the star. And by measuring the kind of light emitted by a star, you can discover the elements that make up that star. And the way this works is when you heat up hydrogen, it releases light of certain wavelengths. Helium, when you heat it, releases light of different wavelengths. Carbon releases a different form of light. Oxygen, all the elements release different wavelengths of light. And that allows us to calculate what elements are found inside of a star. So, population two stars, the ones in the globular clusters, are almost entirely hydrogen and helium. Basically nothing else. And these elements were the first elements formed. They're the simplest and smallest elements, and they were formed towards the end of the Big Bang. And so if a star only contains them, it suggests that they are very old and formed 
closely after the Big Bang. On the other hand, the population one stars, the ones we see all the time, of course they contain a ton of hydrogen and helium. They're mostly hydrogen and helium, but they also contain heavier elements like carbon, oxygen, and iron. So these elements are formed long after the Big Bang. The Big Bang basically ended by forming hydrogen and helium, and then that formed stars. Then those stars, they're burning the hydrogen by fusion, and the waste product of that process is helium. But when they run out of hydrogen, they start burning the helium, and the waste product of that is like carbon. But when they run out of helium, then they start burning the carbon, and the waste product of that is a new element, oxygen, and so forth. And so the elements are built one at a time as stars age. They run out of one fuel, and then they start burning a new fuel that they had produced as the waste product of the previous fusion. So all these elements are actually formed inside of stars, and this is really crazy because these elements that we're talking about that make up everything around us the sun the earth the water the air and not only that our own bodies made of carbon carbon and oxygen and iron our own bodies are made of these elements which were formed inside of stars so this is pretty wild to think that the atoms inside of you, the atoms inside of me, were formed in a star long, long ago. And then that star reached the end of its life. It went supernova, exploded, spread those elements across the galaxy. And then elements once again collapsed to form new stars and to form the planets that orbited those stars and to form the life forms and the people on those planets. So it's pretty wild to think that the, the, there's an old song that says, we are stardust. And it's very true that the very elements that make up your body, your atoms, were formed inside of stars. So this was long after the Big Bang. And so we know that these population one stars that have these heavy elements in them, formed by this process of fusion after fusion after fusion, they have to be younger. So that's how we compare the population one to the population two stars. Population two, almost pure hydrogen and helium, formed in the Big Bang, so they're very old. Population one stars form much more recently because those first stars had to, had to make these heavier elements because they didn't exist after the Big Bang. So population one stars much younger. Here's how I think of it. Population two, those are the two-year-olds. These are the one-year-olds. They're younger, right? So here's a, a diagram that shows some of the things we think about with the Big Bang, and we're going to have another lesson on this later. But the Big Bang, basically about 13 and a half, 14 billion years ago, all matter and all energy exploded out of a single point. Then this made the universe. There was nothing before that, and the universe expanded rapidly at first, and we call this inflation. And so we can kind of see this as a graph. The size went from a single point way up to here really fast, and it continues to expand. Um, along the way, it released this light, which now is in the form of microwave light, and no matter where we look, we see this microwave in the background of the entire universe. Everywhere we look, we can see a little bit of remnant heat from the Big Bang. And we think this was formed about half a million years after the Big Bang. In fact, this picture that they have here is a photograph of the microwave light across the sky. Now, after that, there is a period where we don't really have any light coming to us, so we don't have any information. We call it the Dark Ages. And soon after that, we had the first stars form. So 
at the end of the cosmic background microwave radiation release and just before the dark ages we had the hydrogen and helium formed and then this ended up collapsing to make the oldest stars the population two stars about half a billion years after the big bang then the first galaxy formed about a billion years after the big bang and that's when we started getting the population one stars now these are still forming they're not done yet so we're still getting more population one stars forming all the time and our solar system has been around about four billion years four and a half billion years so we have only our solar system formed around this time and of course we've only been around not even one million years humans so here's a comparison a chart comparing the characteristics of population one and population two stars so the population one stars are found primarily in the spiral arms whereas the older population two stars in the halo and the bulge so they're distributed a little differently then we can compare the percent of the star made of hydrogen and helium versus heavier elements and for both we find out they're almost entirely hydrogen and helium but only a tiny 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 fraction is heavier elements in the population two stars whereas a reasonable amount of the population one stars are these heavy elements and this shows us a differentiation in their ages between less than and more than 10 billion years old since these ones are so old the population two stars they have already aged to the point that they've collapsed down into white dwarfs whereas the population one the younger stars are on the main sequence they're giants and they're super giants in the future they will also age into white dwarfs and then these will age into black dwarfs and they'll be like dark matter so examples include the sun uh, rigel in orion polaris the north star these are all examples of population one stars population two star examples are the stars of the globular clusters And so this leads to the question, how did the Milky Way form anyway? Well, there are a lot of similarities between galaxy formation and star formation. They both involve matter that collapses as a result of gravity and compression heats up the core and more distant material orbits the core in a flat disk. So very similar to the story that we told about the formation of Earth and the Sun but the galaxy is so much bigger than a single star that the matter in the center of it gets compressed into a supermassive black hole and that might be as heavy as a billion suns compressed into a tiny point and what we think probably happened that is that many black holes were formed at first and those gradually merged together with the bigger ones um, absorbing the smaller ones and the biggest one ended up getting bigger and bigger and bigger until it formed this supermassive black hole meanwhile orbiting the center there were these regions of gas and dust and at higher density there would be more compression more gravity pulling things together and these would condense into the globular clusters that we find forming the halo in three dimensions around the center of the galaxy meanwhile most of the matter ends up flattening out into a disk orbiting around the galactic core and so this is a just a behavior of individual particles when they start out in a spinning cloud they tend to flatten out into a disk and in the case of the milky way differences in the rotational speed between regions that were close to the core versus far from the core ended up forming these spiral arms and the dust and gases in the spiral arms still forming new stars today 
and calculations suggest that between three and five new stars are, are formed every year in the Milky Way. Okay, so we're going to watch one quick video here. Um, and this is a computer simulation. showing the formation of the Milky Way. So they make certain assumptions, like the amount of the amount of clouds, the amount of dark matter, the amount of gravity, um, and they input those assumptions into their computer program. And if the computer program is representing reality appropriately, we would end up with something that looks like the Milky Way. So here we're seeing these clusters of gas and dust being pulled together by gravity. And this is at a galactic scale, so it's like 100,000 light years across. The gravity of separate galaxies would pull them together. So we see these smaller galaxies getting pulled in from the edge into the middle of the galaxy we're looking at. We can see it spiraling around. We see matter continually being added to it. And that could well be continuing today. So again, this is on a huge scale, 100,000 light years across and on huge time frames, billions of years that we're watching this happen. And we're compressing it down into like two minutes or something. So the spinning that we're seeing here, remember for the sun to spin around once, is about 250 million years to orbit around once. So this is vastly speeded up, but you can see by the assumptions that they made about how the universe operates, the, the physics of things, they end up, up forming pretty much what looks a lot like a spiral galaxy. There's another video on here um, that I recommend watching. We're not going to watch it right now. It's, I don't know, it's not 10 minutes long, but it's more than five, um, by a guy who does astronomy videos, Professor Dave. So he's got some good stuff on there if you want to explore this more. Okay, so we're going to look at a bunch of other galaxies to finish up, just some images. Um, you don't have to take notes about any of this page. So all of these are photographs. These are not illustrations. And many of them were taken with the Hubble Space Telescope, named after the astronomer who first proved that there were other galaxies beyond the Milky Way, and that, in fact, we were within a galaxy ourselves. A lot of these are visible with binoculars and small telescopes. So people have known about them from before Hubble for several hundred years, but they didn't know they were galaxies. Um, and different people made different catalogs, different lists of these galaxies. And so sometimes they're referred to by a catalog number like M81 or M42. Sometimes they also have a name like the Orion Nebula, which is not a galaxy. It's part of the Milky Way galaxy. But M81 is a separate galaxy. The M is for this astronomer's last name, Messier. Um, other catalogs include the NGC catalog or the IC or the UGC. So sometimes objects that are discovered more recently and weren't known to more older astronomers, um, these only have in an NGC number or something. They might not have a name. But let's look at some of these. 
Here's our closest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31 or NGC 224. You can actually see the Andromeda Galaxy with the naked eye if you look in the right part on a dark night, if you look in the right part of the sky. It's in the constellation Andromeda. Um, it's another spiral galaxy. It's our closest neighbor. And what's interesting, too, is that it has this companion galaxy, a satellite galaxy. I think this is another one. And we think this small galaxy is orbiting Andromeda. Same with this one. The Milky Way also has a couple of these companion galaxies, but only visible from the southern hemisphere. They're named after the explorer Magellan, so they're called the Magellanic Clouds. And maybe in the future, these will end up combining with Andromeda, just like the Magellanic Clouds could join the rest of the Milky Way, getting pulled in by its gravity in the process we watched in that video. Here's the Pinwheel Galaxy. Um, looking straight on the disk and the spiral arms of uh, another galaxy. So we're going to This is an NGC number, and we would call this an elliptical galaxy. It doesn't have any spiral shape. It does have some dark gas clouds and dust clouds in it, probably where new stars are forming. Here's Bode's galaxy, a nice spiral. The Sombrero galaxy. Really? Here's the tadpole galaxy. And not only the tadpole galaxies, but look, here's another galaxy and, and another and another and another. These Hubble photos show many galaxies as we look out beyond the Milky Way. Here's an elliptical galaxy. Um, and it doesn't show much structure. This one's almost perfectly spherical. We think this is probably a very old galaxy. So many stars packed so closely together and so far away that it just looks like this glowing ball of light. Here's the, the Whirlpool Galaxy, a beautiful spiral. It's actually two galaxies. We have this spiral galaxy here, and we have an elliptical next to it. So the Whirlpool itself is M51A, and this one associated with it is M51b. Here we have a barred spiral galaxy. Notice that the spiral arms do not come off the center of the disk. It's kind of like a long bar going across here, like an oval instead of a circle that the spiral arms are coming off of that. Compare that back to the whirlpool where the arms come directly off of the central bulge. So this is a regular spiral and this is a barred spiral. We think the Milky Way is a barred spiral, like this one. And here's a crazy double galaxy that we think is an example of when galaxies have collided with one another. In fact, it looks like Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to collide in the future, maybe another five billion years from now or so. And we'll probably merge into a single giant galaxy that they've already named Milkdromeda. 
Finally, the Hubble Deep Field. So this is a photograph. They decided to take some photos uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope orbiting above the atmosphere, so there's no interference of wind or light or cloud or smog. So we get these very clear images from Hubble. Um, and no matter where we look, every direction, we see lots of galaxies. Hmm, that's a star, right? That's a single point of light. But that and that, those aren't. And what's this long stretched out thing? What are these guys? Those must be galaxies that we're looking at edge on. And the closer we look, the more magnification we use, the more we find. So we zoom in, and here's another spiral, and that's definitely not a single star. Neither are these things. Here's another example. Really nice looking spiral galaxy far, far away in the deep field. And we can zoom in on that, and then what do we see? We see more galaxies that we could zoom in even farther. So they are putting another um, space telescope up. It's called the Webb Space Telescope and named after another astro astronomer. And that will have even more power than the Hubble has.